out there, you are very much welcome to the program exclusive personality on ACNN television, reaching from the nation's capital, Abuja. Exclusive personality is a program designed to educate, inform, and transform members of the public through the experiences of notable personalities who have distinguished themselves in this life through hard work, diligence, and the grace of God. It is also a program designed to treat some topical issues concerning faith, ideologies, and the state of affairs in the polity. Our guest for today is a very good church father and also a preacher, the Right Reverend Stephen Akobe, the Anglican Bishop of Kaaba Diocese. You are welcome to the program, my Lord. Thank you very much. My Lord, oftentimes we hear everywhere um, Bishop Akobe, Stephen Akobe, not everybody might know actually whom he is. My Lord, let us start by knowing whom you are. Who are you, my Lord? Who is Bishop Stephen Akobe? Okay, uh, my name is Stephen Karadi Akobe. I was born in the city of Jos some 54 years ago um, into a lovely uh, family of very devoted and committed dogged Anglicans. Um, I went to primary school in Jos, St. Paul's Township School, and I attended the prestigious uh, Baptist High School in Jos, for which I am extremely, extremely uh, grateful to my parents because it was a huge sacrifice on their part to, you know, to have sent me to that school. And, and I'm eternally grateful for the wealth of experience, the training, the discipline, and the formation and the molding, you know, spiritual and otherwise, that I got from Baptist High School, Joss. And from then I moved on to Quara State College of Technology, um, Ilori, for my IGMB. Uh, when I finished that, I came back to the University of Jos to study uh, Geography, uh, Faculty of Environmental Studies, University of Jos, and finished, went for NYC in Edo State, and um, during the NYC was when I received the definite call into ministry. And, and so I finished the NYC, and, but because then I was saying to myself, well, okay, there's a call to ministry, but well... I still want to do some more studies. So I enrolled for my master's degree at the same University of Jos uh, to study population and man, manpower you know, uh, planning. Uh, and so I started that, that, that uh, master's degree. And um, in between the, the call, you know, the, 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 the pressure, shall I say, uh, to come into the ordained ministry, you know, increased. And um, the Archbishop of Jos, Baba Benjamin Kwashi uh, was quite instrumental. I remember when he came into Jaws as um, the Bishop of Jaws uh, around uh, 1992. We were young boys, and I recall standing amongst the elders mm. in the cathedral compound in Jaws, in St. Luke's Cathedral. Mm. And uh, we were standing, and something struck me about him. I saw a young bishop, shall I say for the first time, a very young bishop, and I watched him. And the first thing he did, he entered into the church compound and went into the church building and straight on went to the chancel, knelt down to pray. And as I watched him, in my heart, something was saying to me, this is what you need to become. Mm. And I was like, wow, well, they will do that later. But we continued, you know, uh, to be members of that same church, but particularly to be members of the youth fellowship of that church. And again, that youth fellowship built me up, groomed me, and also formed my life and made me who I am today. And I, I want to give thanks to uh, bodies like the FCS, the Scripture Union, and, and other churches in just then you know uh that we should say like, stubbornly <laughs> attended uh stubbornly became a part of uh, because we were hungry and thirsty you know for spirituality which we didn't get then in our local church you know and all of those churches all of those you know places where i veered into you know have made me who i am today i'm married 
to my lovely and wonderful and beautiful wife who mm. has been my companion, who is still my companion, my friend, uh, Deborah Abiodun Akobe. And we're blessed with uh, three lovely children, uh, David, Toby Akobe, uh, Tomide, Daniel Akobe, and Dorcas Toyosi Akobe. You notice that they all have T's and D's. That's right. It's, it's deliberate. That's right. Uh, it's deliberate. That's right. And, That's and right. they're doing very well. And we thank God for their lives. Thank you very much, my Lord. I, I didn't, I never knew that uh, a, 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 a geographer can be a, a bishop and a priest. Uh, <laughs> but my Lord, looking at what you just answered, you've told us a little bit about your educational background and yes. all that. But uh, I remember the first time I met you was in Bagauda, yes. in Kano, when That's I was true. in law, law school. Kano. Now, can you just tell us from there uh, your journey so far in ministry, how it started, and all that? We have looked at your educational background, yeah. where you came from. Yeah. Now, you have told us a little bit how. The call came in, but how was it? Your ordination, how it started to where you are now, and you, how you got there? Yes, uh, the Archbishop of Jos, the Most Reverend Dr. Benjamin Aga Kwashi, um, when he came in, for for someone like me, I, I saw in him an example of a man of God. I remember much younger in the choir. He and Most Reverend Josiah Do Ferron came into the cathedral. Then it wasn't a cathedral. They came in for revival. And I remember I, I was in that revival meeting and I listened to the two of them. And their, their sermons, their preaching gave me hope that the Anglican Church, you know, is a place to belong, is a place, you know, to stay. And of course, Growing up from Sunday school into um, the youth fellowship, the choir, the boys' brigade, you know, they formed us, they taught us, they molded us, and they, they, they taught us discipline and integrity. I can't forget all of that. And because I had become a church boy, uh, it was easy, shall I say, to, to have a sense of call and a sense of ministry. But above all was that, I was so sure that when I went for NYC and having gone through the NCCF and all of that, that God spoke to my heart and to my mind that I had a call into the ordained ministry. And there was no mystic. It was the Anglican church that God said to me I was going to come into. And so the journey started with Bishop Kwashi, like I said, Archbishop Kwashi, like I said. He was the one who, you know, opened up his heart and opened up his hands to say, come, I need young men like you, you know, to help us, you know, labor in the vineyard in the diocese of Joss. And because I was sure of my call, and when he opened up his heart and opened up his hands and the diocese, of course, we simply obeyed and we went in. It wasn't easy, mm. but I, I must say, Baba Kwashi is a gift to this church, mm. is a gift to the body of Christ. And he's been able to train and model many, many people. Some are in the, in, in the ministry as ordained clergy. Some are in the ministry not as, again, as, as, not as ordained clergy, but we're all doing the same job. And so from there, we moved on. Got our training, you know, uh, both in Christian Institute, in TCNN, and of course, Crowder Seminary at Belkuta. And I started in Just Diocese, where I was ordained in 1994 and of course deaconed and priested, and then spent about six and a half years to seven years in Jos Diocese, and then I was seconded to Kanu Diocese by request. Uh, the Bishop of Kanu requested for us. He, in fact, he didn't, he didn't know me before. He only heard of my name, and he knew my father. And I, and I said to him many years after when I'd been in Kanu, I said to him that, my Lord, you took a risk. I mean, you didn't know somebody like me, and you brought me into Kanu Diocese, and you brought me into your cathedral to serve in your cathedral and later to become the canon residence of that cathedral and then move on to serve in St. George's. And of course, that's how you met me in Bagauda yes. because I was always coming from yes. uh, St. George's then to minister at the law school. And so that, that's my ministry journey. Uh, first from just diocese, then of course into canon diocese. And then by the grace of God, we were elected in 2010 as the bishop of the Anglican diocese of Kaba.
Relations, my love, once again. So, my love, we could be cry to say that Archbishop Kwashi is your mentor in ministry. Oh, yes, in many ways. That's right. In many that's ways. right. Now, my lord, we have to now go a little bit in things of faith. Okay. Because that's also one of the sensitive of this uh, program. All right. Now, we, 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 as an Anglican bishop, yes. you're a church father. Um, you agree with me that Anglican church believes so much in baptism, I mean, yes. especially infant baptism by sprinkling. Yes. Please, can you now just educate us and the world uh, on baptism generally, but specifically on that uh, infant baptism? Because a lot of controversy are saying, uh -uh, an infant who doesn't know anything, how can you now baptize that mm. child and all that? Mm. Use this opportunity to educate <laughs> people and clear that view. Yes. Baptism, first and foremost, is initiation, introduction, and confirmation. Of one's faith let me say that again yes initiation introduction and confirmation of one's faith the bible says to us in matthew 28 18 through 20 it says go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them and teaching them to observe all that i've commanded you okay it is when somebody is saved when somebody has given their lives over to christ that we speak of baptism in scripture, we see many examples that, for instance, the jailer in Acts chapter 16, uh, the household of Colonius in Acts chapter 10, you know, uh, the um, Ethiopian eunuch that Philip preached to when you study Acts chapter 8, you know, it was after they received the word of God and they were saved that they were baptized. Now, when you are baptized, it is symbolic in which you are dead to sin and raised to life in Christ. It's symbolic in the sense that you're saying, apart from what I've confessed with my lips, apart from what I've believed in my heart, now I'm coming out publicly because baptism is usually done in the open. It's not done in, in the secret. There are weaknesses. It's to say, today, I openly, publicly confess and declare and to show that I've become a child of God. I've given my life over to Christ and so my baptism signifies that I have been made to die with Christ and then raised to life in him. So that today you are saying, look, my address has changed from being a sinner, from being someone who is unrighteous, but to now someone who is a saint in Christ and who is righteous in Christ, all by faith and by grace. All right? Yeah. Now, you talk about infant baptism. Now, the Anglican Church believes in infant baptism. Why do we, be we believe in that? We believe that if we say we are Christians, we have believed as parents, we are born again as parents, then we say we want to introduce, initiate our own children into that same faith in which we have put our trust and confidence. And of course, the Anglican Church provides, you know, the caveat, the proviso, so to say, that this infant doesn't know anything. This infant has not become saved yet. Okay, but we're saying that we want to initiate this child, want to bring in this child into our faith, into our belief, into our practice, even as a child, want to initiate the child and by faith believe that this child will come to know Christ as they grow. Because again, if a child dies as an infant, if a child dies as a baby, will they go to hell or go to heaven? Obviously, they'll go to heaven because they're innocent. They haven't committed any sin. And so grace of God covers them as children. But as they grow up, the Anglican Church provides for what? For confirmation. And says, as that child is growing, that's why we insist that when a child is born, after baptism, of course, first, you choose what we call godly, credible, you know, born again, God parents. Who will do what? Who will stand as shorties? Who will stand as guarantors? Who will stand as instructors? Who we stand as disciples? Who we stand as the people who, who will say we take upon ourselves this burden and responsibility of what? Of making sure that this child comes to faith in Christ. So what we're saying is that at the stage when the child is still a baby, we want to initiate them. I mean, people who believe in um, other gods mm. apart from our true God or who believe in whatever faith or religion it is, they put their, their faith and their trust. At least... They believe that their entire household would also be initiated into that, that same belief. So we're saying that as Christians, as Anglicans who are born again, we're initiating our children. Like I say to young couples, 
who are expecting. I said, once your wife is pregnant, put your hand on your wife's tummy and decree that the unborn child shall be a child of God. Mm -hmm. You are saying that by faith. You are prophesying into the life of that child. Mm -hmm. You will decree and say, this child shall be great. This child will know God. I mean, look at uh, Prophet Samuel, for instance. He was taken into the house of God at a very tender age. What did he know? To the point that when God was even calling him, he couldn't recognize it was the voice of God. But Eli had to do what? Tell him. He was raised in that house. So imagine if he was brought in much older. They can't train him. So we're saying that when that child is brought in, initiated, the godparents do their work of raising the child. At confirmation, that same child is instructed. And the Anglican Church believes that at confirmation, nobody is presented to the bishop for confirmation unless they are born again. You know, sometimes we, we misunderstand these things. Mm. We think that our liturgy is dead. It's because we have not understood the rubrics. We have not understood the mind of those who, you know, put together our liturgy. These things have been provided for. That the child that is brought to baptism as an infant has the opportunity to be raised, to come to know Jesus and confess him as Lord and personal Savior before they are confirmed. And of course, we can take credence and example from scripture. For instance, I mentioned the, the jailer who received Christ. He said, Sirs, what shall I do to be saved? And they told, and they told him. And of course, when he believed, they baptized him and they baptized his entire household. Family. And we know that you know, in every household, there's no how you won't find a child, child there. The same with that of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. They baptized his household. So children must have been there. So the Anglican Church believes firmly that children must have a part, must have a place in the ministry and in the faith that is handed over to us in Scripture. But don't forget, it's not that the Anglican Church is against baptism by mansion. No, no, no. Oh, okay. No, okay. no, no. I was we about believe, asking that. We okay. believe strongly in baptism by mansion. Okay. If the opportunity is there, I mean, I have done it many times, taking people to the river and all of that, and we have baptized them. Those who choose, those who desire, those who want to be baptized by a mansion, they are free. But do you want to baptize an infant? <laughs> in, in the flowing water. No, it's not possible. That's what we do the sprinkling. Thank you very much, my Lord. I think uh, the, the doubts have been cleared by His Lordship. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, my Lord, oftentimes we hear this statement. Yes. Anglican Church is Episcopally led. Yes. And synodically governed. Yes. Throw more light on that, my Lord. Oh, we're a church of order. Bible says that all things be done in order. We're a church of order. The Anglican Church recognizes that the, the one who represents Christ in the church is the Lord Bishop. And so, and that's why we say the cathedral. The idea of the cathedral is that the seat of the bishop is that of teaching, that of proclamation of the gospel, that of, you know, bringing into place, into to bear the mind of God and the will of God for the congregation. But you see, the Anglican Church also believes in democracy, and believes in what we call checks and balances. Mm. So that as the bishop is the episcopus who leads, who receives the mind of God for the people and, you know, has his way in, in spiritual matters. He gives guidance and direction because he must have taken time to pray, to study the scripture and to receive the mind of God as the episcopus. But we now say there is the synod who will listen to the bishop and the bishop also does what? Listens to the synod. And together with the synod, they come out with policies and directions and directives for the diocese. In other words, the Anglican Church says, the bishop, yes, he's revered. The bishop, yes, is the head of the church. But the bishop needs, you know, councils, left, right, and center. He needs people. You know, just like the, the hands of Moses were raised by Joshua and Hall yes, when, when they were fighting yes, the Amalekites. Yes, the bishop alone cannot raise his two hands and just think that he will succeed. He, those hands can become weak sometimes. Yes. And so he needs those people. And that's where the synod comes, comes. in. And the synod is the highest ruling body in every diocese. You know, they together with the bishop, they help to run the diocese. So the Anglican Church has a beautiful structure mm. where, you know, these checks and balances are there. Mm. So the synod checks meets the bishop the bishop also checks the, 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 the synod, you know, and so they work together. Okay. But in our church, you know, we give honor to the place and to the office 
of the bishop. That is why in our church, it's not a matter of age. Yes. You have young bishops like myself, even those who are younger than me, but leading their dioceses, you know, by the spirit of God and by the power of God, and they are doing well. But the synod has its place and has its role and has its work to do. Thank you very much, my Lord. Then, my Lord, can you just tell us a little, just quickly um, what comprises of that uh, synod? Because uh, oftentimes we hear House of Bishop, House <laughs> of Clergy, House of Laity. But we, we have discovered many a time that that House of Bishop is one. Yes, it's one. So can you, is there any theological interpretation by which <laughs> House of Bishop is one? Because when you talk about house, you are looking at congregate of people. The House of Clergy, maybe, for example, they will say, Let's have uh, the chancellor will come and let's have the um, uh, number yeah. house of clergy. You count yeah. house of uh, lady. They say house of bishop one. So just throw more light it, on it, that. It brother. does not matter how many bishops attend the synod of a diocese. There's only one diocesan. Okay. And that's why no matter how many bishops come to attend the, the synod, synod or any service in the in the diocese. Yes, my lord. Only the bishop can carry his pastoral staff, his crusier. All other bishops cannot come with their crusier or their pastoral staff because the jurisdiction, that sea, sea belongs, sea. governed, is directed, you know, by that one bishop. bishop. So when we count the house of bishop in a synod, it's only one. Okay. And that is the, the, the doubt that's that's of that sea. sea. Yes. And then, of course, you have the house of clergy, clergy. you know, according to, uh, you know, then you have the House of Lady. Lady. Yes. So Thank you very much, my Lord. That's a very wonderful one. Then, my Lord, uh, uh, we talk about Holy Communion. Yes. And in Anglican Church, it's being, it, not it presume, it's what it is that it should be for all communicants. Yes. But oftentimes, we discover that uh, polygamists, yes. they are restricted. Yes. Then sometimes, their first wife are allowed. Yes. And the second wife, or maybe third wife, as the case may be, they are not allowed. Yes. But uh, why is that? You see, let's not forget that no matter how people try to justify polygamy, it's not the will of God. Even Solomon and David and the rest of them, you know, who had more than one wife, it wasn't the will of God. God allowed it, you know, because that was where their hearts, you know, had veered to. And of course, remember the Bible says that the many wives, the many strange wives of Solomon, you know, dragged his heart away from the Lord. Now, the Anglican Church believes that Usually, the first wife is innocent. Why, my lord? Why? Because it's, it is not her who has gone to marry another wife uh, for, the, for the husband. It is husband, in most cases, who goes to bring in another woman over her as his second wife. So, given the fact that she was married as the first wife, wedded in church, for instance, as the first wife, and the husband then veers away to bring in a second wife, then we say, we should not punish the first wife. For, for the, the sin. sin, she did not commit. Yes, yeah, she didn't commit any sin. She's innocent, so she should be allowed to participate in communion. But the man and his many other wives <laughs> shouldn't be allowed to because come. the wives are already aware that there's an existing. Oh, they know. They know. they know. they know. They know. But you know, they still come in. And so this is a strong warning to our young people that God does not, you know, in any way condone or support polygamy. He does not. It is a sin. And whatever reason any man wants to give, oh, my first wife is terrible, or my first wife is barren, or blah, 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 is a lie. Forget about it. Sometimes we make decisions in life, and we are the ones responsible for, mm. you know, those wrong choices we have made, and we blame it on God. Thank you very much, my Lord. Uh, then, uh, my Lord, we have to um, be tactful in answering this question. Okay. I have attended a synod. Yes. And I discovered that during procession, yes. in fact, people were gathering and waiting. That if it, it was an Episcopal Synod, yeah. uh, the Shan Synod, before the bishop arrived was taking almost 25 minutes wow. because of the number of clergy and all that. My question, yes. why is it that during procession that you must wait for the most senior or bishop, if it's a decision um, service in Anglican Communion, to come before they bow? before me and he will be the first the most senior to enter the altar is there any theological interpretation on that well do not do not forget that um, if it's a sinner for instance or a diocesan service it is a service of the bishop and in the pontific procession the bishop has pride of place in fact in in our constitution when you read the constitution of diocese you will notice that 
the bishop becomes a visitor to his cathedral. And once he visits his cathedral, he takes the pride of place. He takes preeminence in everything. You know, uh, he, he, the, the bishop in that service is, 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 we can say, you know, is, is the vicar, so to say, representing Christ. And of course, in, in absence of the bishop, the next senior priest, you know, takes that uh, precedence or takes that uh, uh, place as well. And so it is that the Anglican Church believes in that honor that is given to the one who is prime. And if he's the primate, of course, all of us defer to him. And like I say, let me repeat, it does not matter whether by age or anything, mm -hmm. but once somebody has been elected, appointed, or chosen, he takes the pride of place in that kind of setting. So, of course, we do not condone or support late coming in any service. If service is fixed for 10, it's later for 10, the bishop, the pastor, whoever it is, must be there before 10. In fact, what we do in our diocese is that a service meant for 10 usually starts about 5 to 10 minutes before 10. The procession starts. And in some places where there's a very long procession, procession. yes, you shouldn't wait until 10. If the service can start 15 minutes to the time so that the long procession, you know, can get in, you know, and not take, because when procession takes about 30 minutes, we've eaten to the time of the service. the service. So we need to be able to organize ourselves and look at, you know, the way it is and manage it well. And of course, I don't believe in very long, long services. When a service is coming too long unnecessarily, um, again, I think there's no sense in it. We should, we should look, we should concentrate mainly on worship and on the word of God. The, the church service should not be turned to something else or used for another thing or be a platform for something else that is not godly. Thank you very much, my Lord. Uh, we have to uh, leave a little bit of faith now and enter to the <laughs> polity. Okay. I think you have educated us very much well in faith. Now we, we look at what is happening, especially in the life of our youth, my Lord. Mm. Uh, the, ty the type of moral decadence going down every day. People yeah. where you think that you, some youth will think that they have to make it fast. Like looking at you now, you, maybe you drive past. Hi, this man. Don't know that there was a process. You, you went through, you passed through certain challenges that because before you become what you are, what you are yeah. today. Yeah. Now, looking at that moral decadence, will you say that the, the, the parents have failed or the political leaders have failed? Who do we put the blame or are there some remedies that can, you can provide, solution towards that? What has caused the degeneration of moral decadence in, uh, in the state of our youth? Yeah, I think we can blame the parents. We also blame institutions around government and name it why do i say so today i was reading something on um, was it on facebook or yeah facebook and the person sends this post he said do you know that there there are things for which a child could be scolded beaten disciplined and punished in those days and there was a list of about 50 things and one of them was for, for eating too much, for crying too much, for not crying when you are beaten or disciplined, for looking at an elder, you know, eyeball to eyeball. And so many things that in those days, our parents caned us, beat us, disciplined us, you know, for doing. And you, you saw those things as things you should not do, abomination. I remember my father would say things like, don't you have simple etiquette? Mm -hmm. And as I grew up, I used to ask myself, what is that? What, what does it mean? What is the meaning of that word? Etiquette. You know? <laughs> you know? So if, if, you, if you brought water, you didn't, you didn't bring it the right way, way. you know, they'll say, you, you lack etiquette. If you dressed up, you didn't dress very well to school, they say you lack etiquette. etiquette. So our parents in those days were so, so, you know, involved in, with our lives. And they looked at us from head to toe. They, they, they watched you, the way you, you spoke in public, the way you behaved in public. And you know, in those days, just with the look of the, of the eye or, your, or the face of your parents, if they turned in your direction and looked at you one way, you knew what that meant. But today, all of that was thrown to the wings, uh, to the dogs and all of that, in the, in the name of modernity, mm. in the name of um, civilization, civilization, in the name of saying, I don't want, to so I don't want my children to suffer you know, what I suffered. You know? And we are so, we now pamper these kids so much that we now have, you know, 
over overgrown babies in leadership, overgrown babies mm. who have become married and they themselves are now parents who are struggling, you know, to parent themselves first and foremost before even parenting their kids. And then, of course, the government institutions are also very weak. We have schools today where if, if you send your child there and they discipline or punish your child, you know, the parent can go and harass everybody in that school, yes, you know, and say, I will do this, I will do the other. And so teachers are also afraid. Owners of schools are afraid. So they pamper children. And today there are schools where even if children fail, they say, is it the huge school fees they pay? They want to say that a child should repeat or a child has failed. So just say, just push them, just push them. So institutions are weak. The home front is weak. What do you produce? You produce very weak children. So the blame goes to both parents and the society at large. In those days when we were growing up, your parents were not the only persons who would scold you if you did something wrong. Mm. On the street where you lived, everybody on that street who was older than you, who was you know, old enough to give back to you, mm. old enough to be your uncle or your elder brother, they were all the ones who, who were parenting you. So it's a collective parenting. It was a collective parenting. You know, so, and people knew each other. They knew whose son you were, whose daughter you were. You know, so you couldn't, you couldn't misbehave. I remember in those days that the discipline for us was at all levels. If you went late to choir practice, your choir master punished you. The elders in the choir would punish you. If you, if, if you disobeyed the Sunday school, the, the, the Sunday school teacher would punish you. Then they would go back home and tell your parents what you had done wrong. Your parents would still punish you. If you misbehave in school, your teacher will punish you. I mean, in those days when we were growing up, when you saw your headmaster, you were shivering. Yes. Because, you, in fact, you would, you would quickly call yourself to order. Because if your, your headmaster or your head teacher or whoever it was, or your classroom teacher saw you somewhere that they shouldn't have seen you at, or you are misbehaving, you are in trouble. They will punish you in school. You get back home, you, they will, you will be punished. <laughs> so that collective parenting and discipline and training helped to shape many of us in those days mm. i mean of course we saw it as you know hard labor difficult and everything our parents didn't love us but today i'm thankful to my father mm. though he's late thankful to my mother who is alive for the training mm. that they gave to me you know the, the discipline ran across all kinds but you know areas of spirituality areas of your academics areas of the way you dressed areas of relationship with the opposite sex and things like that many of us turned out as virgins because we, we didn't know what it meant to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. Mm. We didn't know those things. We didn't, we didn't know what it meant to drink beer or to smoke cigarettes or to do anything. Because you were so scared. You know, there, there was, it was not as if you didn't have time with your parents or they were not nice people. No, you did or they did. But you see, there was that sense of honor, mm. respect, and, and you know, value for your family name that you will not allow yourself to be found in any of those things. Because... If, 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 if you are found doing any of them, it's as if you had been disowned. And in our time, if your father say, I disown you, he meant a lot. But today, when, when somebody, somebody was saying, if your father says to his son, I disown you, the son will reply and say, I disfather you. Ah. <laughs> you know? So family values have been thrown to the, to the dustbin. They're no longer strong. And many families today have no values. They have no core values. Anything just goes. Daddy is doing his own thing. Mommy is doing his, her own thing. So children also will do whatever they, you know. It's like, it's, it's like a time when there were no kings in Israel and there were no leader. There was no leadership in Israel, and everybody did that that seemeth right. right, you know. And the Bible says there was a generation after Joshua and those people that didn't know God, hmm. you know, and they didn't remember all that the Lord had done, you know, for Israel. So, Melo, what could be the remedy? Can you provide some solutions? The, by the, the remedy now is for us who are young parents to begin to relay the foundation of discipline, mm. the foundation of integrity, the foundation of hard work. That if you are a child of God, if you are a Christian, let it be said that your own children came to know Jesus, came to put faith in Christ through you. Don't let your children get born again outside of you. Yes, sir. Let it be through you. And how do you do that? By your own lifestyle. By your own conduct. When you have that, and your children can see, when you preach and minister to them, they will become, you know, they will come to Christ 
because they can see in you the Christian life and the life of Christ and they become Christians in your own house. Secondly, you must establish sound biblical core values and disciplines in your home. Hmm. These are the things that you can't flout. This cannot happen. That, and you see, you, you don't start when children are already 15, 14. No, you start when they are still babies. Hmm. I remember in our own time, when a child is sucking, you know, uh, the mother's breast, and the child decides to either bite or the teeth. Or to, yes. yes. They would, they would do, you know. So, so the training has started. Started. <laughs> right from when they are babies. I remember when we were kids as well. You know, no, no one tells you fire burns you. In the, in the days of candles mm, and lanterns. lanterns. So when a baby is trying to play with fire, play with the candle, no one tells them fire burns <laughs> or tells her they watch. By the time the baby puts the hand or the finger in fire and it burns, ah! So he learns. So core values must be established yes, sir. by both parents, father and mother, on the same page. So father doesn't say one thing and mommy yes, says another thing. thing. No. These core values must be maintained, upheld, and lived out by the parents and established as foundations on the word of God at home. And then we must tell our young people all this desire to become multimillionaires Over, and overnight. Overnight is wrong. Is wrong. So when these things are built and children know, and then we need to spend more time with our children. We are too busy looking for money. Uh, today, daddy is there, mommy is there. As busy as I am, my, my, my kids, our kids are a bit grown up now, but I remember as busy as I was, and even now, I helped all my kids with their homework. Hmm. I created time, you know, when they were much young, much, much younger than they are now, I baited them. I picked out their clothes for church. I was involved in their lives. And today, my kids can remember you know, places in which my wife and I were involved in their lives as little kids. Mm. Little, little children. I mean, I did school runs. My wife did it. I did it. We, we, would, we would sit down to look at their results. We knew their classroom teachers. And we spoke with them. And we told them that, look, we don't believe in exam or practice. We don't believe in you helping our children to, do, to, to, you know, to pass exam. No. And so we had discussions with their, with their class teachers to know their pace to know their capacity and to know what we can do. And we got lesson teachers for them when, when, when the need arose. We spent time. We went on family outings. We ate out together. We did many So our children saw us in our true state. And it's not like pretending or hypocrisy. No, they saw us in our true state, what we are. And of course, let's be open to our children and tell them how much we earn as salary. Mm. What we can afford, what we can afford. We should not give them bogus impressions about ourselves lies about ourselves these are the things that children see and learn and copy and they become what they become today because you know that their parents are not true but you see when you are open and you are there and you are available and your children can come and discuss anything with you they won't hide anything they will discuss anything about school like one thing we told our children we said never lie to us if you have done something wrong please don't lie if you lie and we discover we'll punish you but if you tell us the truth, we'll not even do anything to you. And you must understand that there are stages in raising children where you don't just start caning, caning, flogging, shouting, screaming. There are stages where you do dialogue. Mm. You just simply interact. You ask questions. And this is what we used to do with our kids. We tell them, look, you know, this is God. This is the Bible. This is Jesus. Now, if you do this, you know, a child of God, if you do this, you will go to hellfire. So... They understood that it was all about God. And then, if you love God, if you obey God, he will bless you. Then, of course, obey your parents, love your parents, God will also bless you. So once we set these foundations, I'm sure things will go well. Wow. Thank you very much, my Lord. You see your family as an example. I, I hope you are learning a lot from his lordship. Thank you very much. Now, my Lord, uh, carbon dioxide. Yeah. You agree with me that many people out there, they don't know Kabadiasis. <laughs> but we know that there are testimonies upon testimonies even before you succeeded your predecessor. Yes. Can you now tell us from time of inauguration to date, the testimonies and the things, good things happening in the Kabadiasis, even to date? Yes. Uh, ours is um, a semi-urban diocese. Um, 
and I want to give thanks to God for my predecessors, two of them. Uh, the first bishop, um, Right Reverend Olaife, who was the first bishop, and the second bishop, uh, Right Reverend uh, Olayoju. They came in as in, in their sixties, but they worked. Mm. They they helped, you know, to establish and to create you know, the foundation on which we are building today. And I thank God for their life. They are both alive. Uh, the first bishop turned 90 oh, uh, wow. a few months ago. Wow. Uh, and the second bishop is in his 80s, of course. And I thank God for them. When we got in, we saw the foundation that, 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 that they had laid. And the Lord gave us grace to begin to build on that foundation. And for us, uh, basically three areas of emphasis. One, spirituality. Mm. We felt we needed to build the people up in the things of God. Uh, our predecessors had tried, but we felt that there was so much syncretism across the land and across the diocese. And people, you know, yes, they, they come to church. Yes, they worship the Lord Jesus Christ. No, no, for a better understanding of uh, lay people, that syncretism, can you just break it down so that <laughs> an average person will understand? Okay. Yeah, yes, uh, it, it's the idea of adding some other things. Some other beliefs okay. to, to, to your Christian faith. Which is contrary to... Yes, which is contrary to, 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 okay. to the word of God. You know, like if you, if you need healing, for instance, you would, you would find some other means that is mm, ungodly. Ungodly. Yes, to add. If, if you want children, for instance, you could go to any length, you know, apart from, you know, staying in scripture to, to have children and all of that. So we discovered that the people needed some spiritual you know building mm. and remodeling and upgrading you know and exposure and so we focused mainly on expository preaching you know uh, doing proper you know exegesis of the scripture opening the scripture mm. making beer the word of god and today i thank god people i can testify that there are changes in the clergy mm. in their lives in their marriage in their ministry, changes in the lives of the membership of the diocese that today many people have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. They've come to put their trust and their faith in him. And evidence of this is in, in their passion, in their openness, in their sincerity, and in their ability to even let go of the things that they possess materially mm. for the service of the church. Okay, so that has happened. Then we also felt that there was a need to help our people to understand more of Anglicanism. We are in a place where there are different denominations. Uh, the Apostolic Church, Living Faith, name it, all of these churches. And because we, we, are, we are from not central Nigeria, but we tend to lean more to the western side. So our people also tend to borrow and copy so many things from their Christ Apostolic Church and all of that. And so when we came in, we saw some of those things that were not Anglican. And we said, no, 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 no. We must bring in Anglicanism and make them understand and uh, and see the beauty of Anglicanism. I remember that in the cathedral, uh, they were not used to chanting the Eucharist. Eucharist. And I said, no. I mean, I love to chant the Eucharist. Yeah. Uh, I love Ang Anglicanism. That's right. And I had to get someone, you know, to come and teach them. And today, you won't believe it. In our small diocese, when we have services at the diocesan level, the choir, you know, the people chant Chance. the Eucharist and we enjoy wow. worshiping the Lord. So spirituality was one thing. Thirdly, we felt we needed to establish more churches. Given our circumstance, given our capacity, given where we are and all of that, we have at least planted about nine churches. Hmm. You know, and not just planting them, we have also built some of them up and they are standing today with their own church building and their own vicarage. And I want to thank God that the Lord helped us to raise some young clergy who are doing exploits. Mm. Oh, they are doing marvelous things. Uh, they're doing great things. They're doing, uh, you know, sometimes they say, we're following you, my Lord. When I go to some of the churches, I say, who taught you this? They say, my Lord, you taught us now. We're following you. I say, <laughs> so we're grateful to God for that. A testimony. Yes. We have investments um, in, in, in various areas. They're not much, but the Lord has helped us to raise funds and to put uh, our, our money in, in investment. We have some residential buildings that we have for rent. We have some shops, you know, also for rent. We have a small farm where we have some uh, 
uh, pigs, uh, poultry, right. and, and all of that as a way of investment. Right. And then we're involved in outreaches, you know, medical outreaches to, to, to provide health care for members of our diocese and those who are not even members of our church. So we are, we are fully on ground by the grace of God with limited resources. We are pushing, we are moving, and God is helping us. But for me, the greatest testimony that I would say the Lord has given to us is in the lives that have been transformed, that have been changed, that have come to put their faith and their trust in Christ. And every 31st of December, I go to the cathedral to be with them for the watch night service. And I sit back and I hear people testify. Mm. And when I hear things, they say, oh, God answers prayer. Oh, I want to thank our pastors, the bishop and the clergy for what they do for us and the, you know, the things they teach us and the prayers they pray for us and how God is moving in our lives and God is answering our prayers and God is doing great things. I say, oh God, to you be the glory. Okay. For me, that's the greatest legacy that I want to leave in the of Kaaba, that I was there and the Lord helped us to bring people to faith in Christ and to grow as disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. To God be the glory. Thank you, my Lord Bishop. Yeah. Now, my Lord, before we, 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 we say bye to this, uh, mm. what is your general advice to the church yeah. and to the nation? For the church, beginning with the Anglican church, we, we must surrender completely to the Lord Jesus Christ. Any of us who is in any office today, from the primate down to the least, is a privilege. Mm. It's an opportunity. It's a season. And God expects us to leave a mark. Not a mark in our name, but a mark for the name, for the glory, for the honor, and for the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is this mark that will count in heaven. It's not whatever we gather here or whatever we establish here that heaven would remember, remember us for and count on our, on, on our behalf. But it is that we did the bidding and the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I, 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 as a bishop, when I look at the office of primate, I, I get, you know, shivers and fear and, and you know, you, how do I put it? You know, I, I become afraid. Yes. Because at my level as bishop, people call me on phone. People are asking for guidance. People are asking for information. People want to see me. They want me to be here and there. And whatever I say, they take it as authority. How much more? The primate. Level, yeah, the, the, the primate. Mm. So we must be careful. And secondly, we must endeavor to lead our people to Christ. The Anglican church membership must not remain as nominal Christians. We must be discipled. We must be committed, dedicated Christians all across the nation. And of course, by extension, this also covers all Christian bodies, all churches. Because the main thing is that Jesus is made known and that we who are leaders, you know, proclaim him. I mean, like the Apostle Paul, his life, his testimony, his ministry was all to proclaim Christ. He says, for me to live is Christ. And to, and die, to die is gain. is gain. And he says, I have been crucified with Christ. The life I now live is no longer mine, but I live by faith in the Son of God who died for me. Galatians 2.20. And so when we see ministry and we see the church like that, because some have turned the church to a means of making money. Mm. They are making a merchandise out of the gospel. Some are, some are projecting their personal you know, agenda, mm. their personal pursuit. No, no, no. It's the kingdom of God. You are here only for a time. Yes. And when your job is done, you will leave. And let's not forget that because you are bishop to do whatever you, whatever you think you are, it's not because you are the best. There are others who are far more better than you. But it is grace that is upon you. Let's not abuse that grace. And the church must make sure that we shape society. We influence society. You know, you, you, you must have this cosmopolitan outlook. Don't just say, I'm an Anglican. No, you are a child of God. And you are for every denomination. And you are for everybody. Whatever good you can do for anyone, do it. Whatever you can give to anyone, give it. Wherever you can preach the gospel, preach it. So the church cannot be docile. The church cannot just be silent. We must influence our society. In that our little corner, we must show that there is power 
in the gospel. Like Paul says, he says, so that I didn't come to you, he was speaking to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. He says, when I came to you, I didn't come with high sounding words and all of that, but I came and I spoke to you the gospel of Christ so that the cross of Christ will not be made empty, will not, will not, will not be emptied of his power. That is power in the gospel. That is power in the cross of Christ. And once we live that same life and preach that same gospel, we will see the effect in society. Let us not have a form of godliness and will deny the power thereof. For politicians, I think it's clear to all Nigerians. What the average Nigerian wants, I think he just wants a good country where you can get things, food and other things, you know, at affordable price. If it's petrol, whatever it is, just name it. Where somebody who earns a salary can count their salary and say, okay, this is how much I'm earning in a month, and can go to the market or anywhere and buy what they want to buy. They can go to school. This is not the kind of Nigeria that anybody is happy with. So for those who are in politics, for those who are in governance, I think all we're saying is, can you please govern well? Can you please govern in the fear of God? Can you please have you know, this human face? Can you, can you please be real? You know, in Nigeria, we have a problem. What is that problem? There's this dichotomy. Those who are leading us are our bosses. They are our rulers. Those of us who are being led, we are the slaves. And, and sometimes you would hear that an aircraft is delayed because of one VIP. Who is that VIP? Mm. You know, you hear that something is done, you know, because of this person. But when it comes to the masses, it's, it's the other way around. So my appeal is, those, those who are Christians in, gov in, in, in governance and in politics, please, can you be the light? The light of the world and the salt of the earth. Can you make a difference? It is possible to have Christians in politics who will go there and represent Christ. Mm. Not represent even the church now, but represent Christ. Live like Christ and do what Christ would do. And I'm sure we will have many people like that. And if you're a Muslim, can you do the right thing as well? So that when you do the right thing, the nation would be better. What we are going through today as a country is a failure of leadership, is a deficit of leadership, and we must put the blame squarely on leadership. Not just this government alone, but governments before now. Before now. If, we have, if, if, if our leaders had done what they ought to have done before now, the, the Nigeria would have been better than America, better than England. I mean, the transport system that runs well in England can be replicated in this country. We have the resources. 24 hours of power supply can be done in Nigeria. It's possible. The resources are there. There are many other nations that are not as blessed as this country. But we have squandered the resources. And like this dichotomy that I mentioned, we must break it. We must all be equal. There shouldn't be sacred cows. We are all Nigerians. And the cost of governance is just too high. The, what, what politicians are making. And that's why people are killing themselves to and there. fighting to, you know, to, to get there. If, if it's not attractive, why would they be fighting to get there? So these are the changes I believe that we must bring about in our country. Thank you very much, my Lord. Let everybody do his beats, both the leaders, of course, and the led. Do your own beats, and I do my own beats, and the nation and the church will be a better place to stay. My Lord, I want to appreciate you so much Thank for you. coming. Thank you. And we pray that the Lord will continue to increase you, Amen. see you through your ministry, Amen. and give you more testimony to share. Amen. Thank you for having this time with us. Amen. And may the Lord be with you, my Lord. Amen. Thank you very much. In this life that is full of uncertainties, uh, lots are confused, especially when they are faced with circumstances that are very challenging to them. From our discussions today, we could see from our guests that there is no height in life you could not attain, regardless of any difficult challenges in life. Furthermore, leaders in all spheres of life are advised to play their leadership role effectively, efficiently, and satisfactorily for the betterment of all. Finally, remember that the only person who can stop you from getting to the height in life you desire is yourself. Therefore, be diligent, keep pushing, 
Don't give up. And someday you will get there. Remember when the going gets tough. It is only the tough that gets going. This is where we draw the curtain on today's episode of the program. Join us same time, same station on another episode of the program. Until then, this is Anna Zichin. So wish you the very best and bye for now.